Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me Bill and having spent last week uh, most definitely in the digital domain this week we're going to return very firmly to the analogue domain although we're going to make use of a fair chunk of digital equipment to do the measurements on that, uh, that analogue electronics and analogue circuitry and the topic this week is measuring the output power of um, a transmitter, in particular a, a single sideband transmitter. And the problem, of course, measuring single sideband transmissions is that in between the, the speech peaks, there isn't any power coming out of the transmitter, so it's actually quite difficult to, to get uh, a measurement. And uh, normal power meters are, are notoriously inaccurate. So using some fairly straightforward kit here in the lab, we'll see if we can, can make some sensible measurements. And the radio we're going to use to, to do the measurements on is this one here. This is a kit. Uh, it's a kit from Walford Electronics. I'm going to put a link to Walford Electronics in the description. Tim Walford, G3 PCJ, produces and has produced electronic kits for, for at least 20 years, to my knowledge. They're really excellent kits. They've got um, very good instructions. They're very constructor friendly. Uh, I think Tim has really thought through um, the way you're going to build the kit and how you're going to use it, which I think is very helpful. Really comprehensive instructions um, and you really can build them with, with a minimum of test equipment really. When I built this radio I didn't have the test equipment that I've got now, so it'll be interesting to see um, how it's performing after, after all these years. So, uh, it's a single sideband transmitter and it uses the SA602 um, uh, double balance mixer for both, uh, both bits of mixing that go on in the transmitter chain. Uh, that chip hasn't been made since about, I think it's about 2010. So this kit is discontinued, but I know for a fact there are other kits um, on Tim's website. And if this puts you off, he's got beginner, intermediate and advanced kits. So there's something for everybody. So please do take a look. I'm not, um, I'm not uh, on any kind of commission. I'm just impressed with, with what I've had. So I you know, encourage you to have a look and if you can support him. Right, let's have a look at what we're dealing with here in terms of single sideband and how it's related to amplitude modulation. Okay, let's just quickly remind ourselves uh, what we're dealing with here. Single sideband is actually a derivative of amplitude modulation. And amplitude modulation is essentially a carrier wave and a modulating wave. In this case, these are just a couple taken off my signal generator and modulating that carrier with that blue modulation waveform produces characteristic modulation envelope where the amplitude of the carrier wave frequency is following the waveform of the modulated waveform, if that makes sense. Um, so if we think of uh, the two waves as A and B, um, when we modulate, we obviously continue to get A and B, but we also get A plus B and A minus B. So we get A plus B which is the upper sideband component and A minus B which is the lower sideband component. Uh, if you view that on a spectrum analyzer this is the carrier wave, um, just the carrier wave and if you then modulate that carrier wave you can see straight away it gets wider. If I just go back to the carrier wave you can see there's quite a a width change and that width change effectively is the two sidebands. It's not particularly distinct on the um, resolution of my cheap and cheerful spectrum analyzer but it does at least give you an idea how much difference there is between carrier wave which is very narrow band and the modulated wave which is a lot wider. Real life amplitude modulation looks a bit like this. Here's a screen grab from one of my ICOM receivers. This is a um, a strong AM broadcast station in the uh, 19 meter band and first things to note is a very bright line down the middle at zero which is the carrier wave and then either side of that you've got symmetrical um, lower and upper side bands and if you look you can see those side bands extend certainly beyond four divisions either side um, arguably they extend to to five and maybe a little bit further than that even. Um, and so single sideband essentially is just one of those sidebands. And if you think about it, the carrier wave doesn't actually carry 
any information it's just a carrier the lower and the upper sideband are actually mirror images of each other so we only actually need one to get the required modulation information and as long as we can find a way to um, remove and put the carrier back in when we receive the signal we don't actually need to transmit the carrier either and that results in considerable efficiency in terms of the amount of energy required so here on the same settings is a single sideband transmission this one's and five megahertz it's actually uh, the aircraft uh, weather station transmitted from from the west of ireland and things to note first of all is how much narrower it is it's you know it, it's four or five kilohertz wide at the very most and you could fit you know five maybe six of those into the same width that the am transmission above is taking and particularly important to notice is in between the speech peaks and there's a couple of examples of arrows are pointing to there where there's a there's a space between words nothing is being transmitted at all so uh, actually that means there's very little energy being put through the, the transmitter and that's obviously quite efficient from uh, generating heat and using power point of view unfortunately that makes it difficult for us to measure because where do you make a measurement if we modulate the sideband with a single tone we actually theoretically just get one tone and that isn't necessarily completely realistic so the usual method is to use what's called the two-tone uh, method where two, to um, two tones modulate the sideband signal now a typical SSB speech envelope uh, looks a little bit like that and you can see the problem we're facing there is exactly you know where would we make the measurement it'd be difficult even to get some kind of average whereas if you modulate with a uh, Two tone that are not harmonic related, you get that characteristic two tone modulation envelope, and it makes it much easier to make a, uh, a repeatable and accurate measurement of the um, where the peaks of the modulation are. Peak envelope power uh, in watts is equal to the voltage peak to peak squared divided by eight times the load resistance, and in this case, the load resistance. Is a dummy load which has a DC resistance of about 47 and a half ohms in the case of my dummy load however at 7 megahertz it'll be a bit different so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my vector network analyzer to measure the impedance of my dummy load at 7.1 megahertz so let's go and do that now okay so I've got the dummy load attached to my vector network analyzer and I've just got it displaying Smith chart and appreciate that's really difficult to see on the screen so I'm going to um, show you a close-up in a moment but what we're doing there is we've got the frequency currently set to 7.12 megahertz so pretty much in the middle of the 40 meter amateur band and I'm going to take the um, power measurements at about 7.12 megahertz on the transmitter as well and as you can see there it's saying well you probably can't see but if you could see it's saying 46.4 ohms so that's the um, impedance of the dummy load at this frequency and so the 46.4 ohms is the number that I'm going to use um, for calculation purposes the DC resistance of this dummy load is about 47 and a half ohms something like that so it'll make um, a small difference but um, no harm in uh, going for a bit of accuracy okay having um, used the vector network analyzer to measure the impedance of my dummy load at 7 megahertz let's now connect that up to the transceiver and see if we can take some measurements so here's the general arrangement for doing the measurement um, got the top off the receiver now and as you can see she consists of well one large circuit board actually a closer view you can see it's two separate ones this is the receiver that's the transmitter and the the VFO on the receiver uh, provides the uh, oscillator signal for the transmitter as well so that the receiver and transmitter uh, netted onto the same frequency so arrangement is really very simple we've got the um, 
rig being supplied with a 12 volt bench supply um, I'm going to key the transmitter just using the, the PTT on the mic and I've got uh, a wire here that's this yellow wire here connected to the audio in uh, and here are two um, the two waves from the um, signal generator come in on the white and the orange cable there and I've got to just set up a little mixer with a couple of uh, resistors and then I've got another resistor there to give it about a 600 ohm output impedance that's probably not too fussy but um, it can only help so the two tone signal gets fed in there uh, over here on the far side uh, I've got a oscilloscope probe set to times 10 and the dummy load attached to the, to the rear of the radio here um, so it's simply a case now of um, uh, turning everything on and doing some tests Okay, so now I've got the, um, you probably just about hear the tone actually. So I've got the two tones being fed in through the mixer into the input. Currently the rig's on receive, it's drawing about 48 milliamps according to my bench power supply. So I'm now going to key up, and I'm, rather than keep flitting between the view of the scope and this, I'm going to just take some, some screen grabs of the, the scope and then uh, I'll superimpose them so you can see uh, the results that we're getting and we'll do the analysis a little bit later. So um, we go over onto transmit like so. So current is now up at about, about 880 milliamps and I've got a display on the screen that's um, and I'm just going to take a grab of that there that's that one and I've got the two cursors in position so um, it's currently saying about 33 volts something peak to peak but we will check that uh, on the screen grab um, and measurement um, is as simple as that really uh, so just feel the dummy load no noticeable heating um, this rig is a QRP rig it doesn't put out a great deal of power um, next thing we're going to do is transmit again but this time we'll set the scope up for fast Fourier uh, display so that we can instead of looking in time domain we can look in frequency domain and we can see perhaps um, uh, what the spurious emissions look like on this radio so I'll just change the scope over to fast Fourier transform like so and I'll key up again and we've got the display there I'll just tweak that so you can see second and third harmonic and I'll take a screen grab so that's the screen grab there and now we've got that information we'll we'll analyze that um, in a moment or two so as you can see actually really easy to um, to set up and do the test obviously I need a temporary arrangement here to feed the two tones in um, to the audio in um, using the PTT on the microphone is as good as anything to get the transmitter to uh, to key up and uh, I've got as I say I've got the scout probe here set to, um, to times 10 so I've got a bit of attenuation I've also taken these measurements with the uh, rig hooked up via the same oscilloscope probe to the tiny SA the spectrum analyzer so we can also um, have a look um, in a bit more detail at the results that we've got from that as well okay let's look at uh, the results and here's a screen grab of the two tone envelope coming out of the transmitter and I'm modulating that with two tones one at 700 Hertz and the other one at 1.9 kilohertz they're not harmonic related as I mentioned earlier uh, they're being fed in um, through the audio input to the transmitter and I've put uh, the cursors at the extremities of the envelope bottom right hand side you can see the scopes telling us the um, the delta between the two cursors is 32 volts uh, you may recall peak envelope power in watts is that voltage squared that's the volts peak to peak squared divided by 8 times the load resistance we use the vector network analyzer to measure the load resistance as 46.4 ohms we know we've got 32 volts peak to peak so if we substitute those into the equation uh, that gives us an answer of 2.76 watts so that's a nice um, healthy output for a QRP transmitter um, now that's viewed in conventional um, 
time domain let's just have a look what um, the scope makes of that in frequency domain because this is quite interesting so on the left you've got the fundamental peak there and middle is the second harmonic and the right hand peak is the third harmonic so if you look at the delta between the fundamental and the second harmonic the scope makes that out to be 27.2 dB um, that's probably not enough uh, you'd ideally want that to be um, at least 35 maybe even 40 dB um, below the fundamental for that to be satisfactory so a little bit, little bit more output filtering required there to remove that uh, that second harmonic the third harmonic uh, is about 38 dB down so that would be uh, acceptable between 35 and 40 dB but we'd certainly need to, to do something about um, some kind of low-pass filtering to get rid of that uh, that second harmonic. Looking at that on the spectrum analyzer, I just thought it might be interesting to see the impact of that. Okay, it's only a couple of watts, I know, and you can see the fundamental there on the left-hand side, and then you can see three more peaks, um, and the pale grey vertical bars are the amateur bands. So we've got on the left-hand side is the 40-meter band and the second harmonic is falling in the uh, 20 meter band third harmonic is falling in the uh, top end of the 15 meter band and as you can see we've got a harmonic okay it's well down it's over 50 dB down so wouldn't be a concern uh, that falls in the 10 meter band um, so if ever you wanted a nice example of why the amateur bands are harmonically related um, there it is so it's only other radio amateurs I'd be causing aggravation to, although I suspect with my two point something watts it probably wouldn't be causing, causing too much aggravation. However, uh, before we want to use that transmitter we definitely want to do something about uh, reducing the output of that second harmonic. OK, well I hope that's um, made some sense and has perhaps um, encouraged you to perhaps have a go and it's perhaps been a bit thought provoking. Um, it certainly allowed me to take some, some measurements which uh, in the past I've only sort of read about in books so it's been in interesting to bring that to life. I've enjoyed that learning curve very much. If you can try this on a, a more powerful transmitter, particularly in our conventional 100 watt transmitter, please be careful because the voltages are going to be a great deal higher than um, that you're going to get for something that produces a, you know, a couple of watts. You might recall we actually got 32 volts out of that one so if you think about how many volts you're going to get from 100 watts of, of single side band so so just be aware of that if you're going to um, start measuring things like that maybe maybe wind the power back if you want to have a go but i would encourage you to have a go because for me that's what um, brings electronics to life and actually makes um, the theory suddenly become real and allow you to touch it and understand it okay hope you've enjoyed that if you have please click the thumbs up if not you can click the thumbs down it'd be absolutely great if you could subscribe thanks very much for all the comments i've been getting please keep them coming and we'll see you on the next one